Um, we are in Revelation chapter 17. Um, as is our custom, I would like for us to start by reading the text together. Um, if you um, need to close your eyes and visualize this, feel free to. Um, but could I ask for someone to read? Sure, you got this. <laughs> Laura? I'll do it. Okay. All right. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her and the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and her filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. I saw that woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has seven heads and 10 horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom, the seven heads and seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he come, does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his called chosen and faithful, faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where, where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Everyone, everyone on board? Okay, perfect. Well, class dismissed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want to, what I want us to do is I want us to kind of go back to go through the chapter together, kind of pulling a few verses at a time and just looking at the imagery. Um, and then at the end of our class, probably pull maybe a few points that would be applicable for us, but yet are also true to the text. Um, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping to accomplish for us tonight. Um, if at any point you have a comment or a question, feel free to chime in. Those of you who are online, uh, the same goes for you. Feel free to make a comment whenever you um, have one to be made or have a question that you'd like to go for. Uh, but as we start in chapter 17, um, I think we have to place 17 in the seventh bowl, or it's either in the seventh bowl, I'm probably placing it in the seventh bowl. Uh, it could be between the sixth and the seventh bowl of chapter 16. I'm looking at it more as part of the seventh bowl. If you look at verse 19, this is Revelation 16, verse 19, it says, the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nation fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drink, uh, drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. Um, so I'm looking really at chapter 17 as zooming in 
on chapter 16, verse 19. So that when John is, is seeing the seventh bowl being poured out, he is seeing a global destruction. He's seeing everything happen. Uh, but I think chapter 17 is taking us into this pinpoint moment to see what's going on. And so I think John is visioning the judgment of the harlot in this situation, the prostitute. And although he sees the beginning of the chapter, um, he sees this prosperity. He sees a, a level of wealth that I, I, <clears throat> I think dictates um, her position. Um, you know, chapter, uh, verse one says that she sits on many waters. Uh, verse 15 of the same chapter tells us what, what symbolizes the water or what, yeah, how, what is the water symbolizing? Nations. Nations, people, uh, multitudes, Nations. languages. So and she... Go ahead. And it's kind of interesting that this may explain chapter 13 with the beast coming out of the water. We, we do see some... I mean, that's really this... This I'm going to say marriaging of, of ideas, but you're seeing this imagery from chapter 13 of the beast um, and how it is coming out of the water. I, I hadn't really thought of the coming out part, but I had built a connection between the, the past. And, and so you have this beast who sits on the water. The woman is on the beast. We know that from verse 15, the waters are representing all these people so who's the great prostitute? See, false religion. A false religion. I asked that question because when I first began, my gut thought was Rome. And I found that it, maybe even last week I found I fell into this trap. I don't remember, but that maybe I began too quickly to try and think about how it interpreted out instead of thinking about what the text might have actually been trying to say. So I want to make sure that, because I, I said that myself, I felt prey to that, but I want to make sure that we don't fall prey to that too. But that's not a bad assumption. Clause. No. Um, but, but you're contrasting mm. the bride dressed in white compared to the great prostitute. So, that's got to play into it somewhere. But if, if Rome has elevated her Caesar to Lord God, our divine savior, is really, <coughs> then it fits. Not that it, yeah, not, thank you for that. Not that I don't want us to make the association to Rome, because I think it does fit. What, hey, Josh. You got audio? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, I was, I'm curious. A lot of times when um, Israel's unfaithful or the people of God are unfaithful, they're, they're uh, accused of adultery. Uh, so I'm wondering if it, if it means unfaithfulness, wouldn't it be somebody that at once had faithfulness? I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too much about it. I think that your question is an appropriate question. I don't think that adultery in that case has to be someone who was once faithful. I could be wrong in that. Um, I feel like there's some Old Testament idea that anyone who is not a part of God is kind of a, in, con in contrast from God. But, but I don't know. I, I don't know how best to answer that. Greg, go ahead. If, if you consider the great prostitute as false religion, uh, maybe let's label it syncretism. Take a little bit of this, you know, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of New Age thought, uh, a little bit of Islam, a little bit of Buddhism, pantheism, merge them all together. And you come up with something. 
the law practice basically just represents sin. And this, you know, Revelations is written in symbols, so one you don't know what's going on. And so they, that's the reason they write it that way. And then, then they're looking for they're looking for a, a savior or something, and 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 some of them don't know who it is, and 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 they won't tell them. And so you, you know, they talk about uh, the guy that, you know, the blind man, the guy the man. So they they tried to get at him. Well, he done it. He said, I don't know. And then, well, the parents did because they didn't know what they'd do to him. And uh, so, but the guy that, that received the, uh, his sight, he says, I don't know. It's just a man who made clay and put on my eyes and told me to go go to the river and, and, and wash it and I could see. And I know, all I know is I can see. And you know, I don't know how you, I don't know how you put all those symbols together and to come out with what it really meant to the well, and it, and it don't come out right for all nations. So it come, comes out just for God's people. When at some point, we can probably chase trying to figure out what the symbols meant to the point where we've driven ourselves mad or the point where we aren't even being honest with what you yeah. said at the end is that God's people make this through this. Yeah. And that's the point that we really find at the end of chapter 17, my opinion, is... God's people still make it. The, the, the point, and I think this connects Revelation to 2 Thessalonians, the man of sin, is that, and maybe it happens in every age, but there is somebody that has the power of government and religion in their hand. And before the end time, or at the end time, this dude is going to have real power. He's going to have world government, world religion. He's going to control them both. And you've got mechanisms. You've got mechanisms that can set that up. Ever hear of World Council of Churches? United Nations? And if you said, as you said, think about certain time periods, let's move back, let's move back a thousand years, give or take. <coughs> you talk about the Catholic Church and how favorable or how much in bed they were with other nations and, government. and governments and how that control yielded a single person who had a lot of power. Yeah. All these great powers came or don't come to them and did come to them. And in the end, That's the that's the image of of the rock that's cut out of out of the mountain and the statue. You know, I, I have a reference here for us to just even I'll read it for you, but it's Jeremiah fifty one verse seven, talking about drinking out of the golden cup. But it says Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand making all the earth drunken, the nations drunk of her wine, therefore the nations went mad. I think we see that who, whoever, the, and that's where I, I started the class to make sure that I want you to know, I don't want to get the cart before the horse in interpretation. I want us to try and be as honest to what we're, we're dealing with. And, and I think we see here that 
I, I believe it's Rome for the initial context, but she leads other nations, individuals, and peoples to be unbelieving, to be idolatrous, and to be as immoral as possible. And her idolatrous influences um, are really highlighted. I, I counted seven times in the opening verses of this section. You'll see the word uh, a prostitute or adultery coming up seven times in just a short range of text. I, I think that's telling us what, one, what her great sins are. Is, is kind of come back to where Mike was taking us. Her great sin is the ability to lead people away to something false. Now we move into verse three. And as we've come now to verse three, uh, John is carried away in the spirit. I think in the spirit, it's telling us that this is from God. He's being moved to another vantage point. Uh, and we see now that the prostitute is on a beast in the wilderness. I think the wilderness can serve as a positive place oftentimes in the Old Testament, um, but here it serves as a place of judgment. And so we see that she is sitting on the back of the beast. I think the beast is symbolizing evil in the world. And so as she's sitting there, we know a partnership exists between the beast and the prostitute. And uh, going back to, I think Greg said, was at Revelation 13 is where we initially are introduced to this beast. Um, going back to Revelation 13, does anyone remember or want to take a guess at what the beast was representing there? The Antichrist. And Greg, Greg was hitting all around <laughs> this a moment ago. Who, who does this, what, what power does this Antichrist yield in his hand? Government. Government, so politics, political. What else? When God brings judgment, we always see what, what are the early steps of the judgment cycle? Pestilence. I'm going to call that economic, economic impact. We see a political impact. We see an economic impact. We see a military impact. We see all of these qualities being possessed in this beast of a Satan, if you will. And so the beast is, is described here in verses three, four area as scarlet covered or scarlet covered with blasphemous names. Um, blasphemous names would basically means that there are just false names of God. It claims to be a God. And then it has seven head, seven heads and 10 horns. Uh, moving into verse four and five, we see that the woman's arrayed with purple and scarlet. Um, when we see the word, the colors purple and scarlet, um, what what should come to our mind? Wealth and royalty. Wealth, royalty, luxury. So the woman is living that style of a life, and she has this golden cup that says it's full of the um, abominable things with the filth of her adulteries. I think this is just showing us how immoral of a person she is. She is drunk on self-indulgence. She's drunk on power. She's drunk off of the wealth of others. She's given a name on her forehead. And what's the name that's written on her forehead? Babylon, the great mother of whores and of earth's abominations. Mm. How would you like that name? <clears throat> no, thank you. <laughs> We, we start, as, as we're told, it's a mystery. Babylon's name is a mystery here. I, I, I kind of see two ideas of what this could be. Um, I, I think, one, we see that this is an ending of time mystery idea that we, but we, could, we could build with. But I think, two, it's really an unfolding of events that might be unexpected or even in some ways ironic. She is called the mother of all prostitutes, and I, I, I'm taking that to mean that her Everything she does, she, she's birthing off of her other people who are filling in that idolatrous world. We move to verse 6. It says, the woman was drunk on the blood of the saints. So Babylon, that's, I'm going to try and stick to the original text here of Babylon. Yet again, I think that, that the, the direct 
uh, readers would have said Rome, but is drunk off of persecution of the Christians. We talk about persecution today. Are we at that point yet? Not to the point. Probably close. In our little world right here, not to the point that Christians in uh, what's that African country with the uh, Nigeria, I think, or the situation that the, the ancient Christians in Iraq and Iran are in. <coughs> That's some serious doing. We, we, we yet to fear for our life. I do agree. I think that I think the imagery of Revelation 17 is far more present than we like to build or what we like to think. We don't deal with this persecution like Christians do in, in parts of Africa or in the Middle East. So I also sit and say, man, the, the persecution that they're experiencing is far greater than, than what we're, we're being uh, dealt to believe. I mean, uh, you know, at the time of well, it was a demission, I think. Christians were dipped in tar and used on crosses to light the roads to Rome. So uh, I've yet to be turned into a human light post. But the Christians here are defined as God's holy people. And what else? How else are they defined? Well, I don't think we're as close as they are. Or for idolatry. Uh, that seemed to be their big, biggest problems. Ours. You know, we make a, it's easy to make a big deal out of the adultery component, but this is a place that's just full of idolatry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the imagery that we're, I think here in a minute I'll come across, I, I kind of listed out four sins that I see really pinpointed, but idolatry is the biggest thing. Their inability to commit yeah, to God as a God. We're, we're told here though, it, the thing I, I love is, is that Christians are defined as God's holy people because they bear the witness of Jesus. I think that John is thinking of Nero's persecution and we know that in time that escalates with Domitian um, and then we see that John says that he is perplexed. He's kind of in this state of shock. Um, I think we see that because in John's perspective, he is wanting to see the prostitute fall. He's wanting to see um, all this, the, the blaspheming of God and the murdering of God's people come to an end. And right away, he is not. Right away, he has seen really what looks like even a growth of her wealth. Um, she's you know, sitting on in, in wearing purple and having a gold cup, and all this, I think we see her even gaining more. And then the angel steps in. This is what in verse eight, the angel steps in now to give an interpretation. Um, the angel basically says, look, John, this is, this is what you've really seen, or this is what you're seeing. The beast um, dying and the rising, the idea that he is, he was, um, and will come again. This idea here, uh, you know, this is actually verse eight, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit. I, I think that this goes back to what Greg said at the chapter in verse one is this, we're, we're always comparing the beast to the lamb. Evil is always trying to come off as, as the truth. And what, what we see in verse one is the beast is trying to come off as good here in verse eight, I think we see the beast trying to come off as the lamb or as Jesus Christ, because where else do we see in the Bible the idea of a death and resurrection? Easter story. It's the Easter story. It's where Jesus comes back from that. So I think we see that they're trying to build this, uh, that the 
antichrist, the false teacher that we're, we're talking about, tries to build that story of, I'm a God. Um, we've talked before about the Nero story. Does anyone remember the Nero story from, from past classes? Committed suicide somewhere around 68 uh, June, in, in the month of June, I think. Uh, he committed suicide, uh, basically at the invitation of the Roman Senate, uh, because they were going to do him in if he didn't. Um, and the idea was that he really didn't die. He went off to Parthia. And he was assembling an army to come back and sack Rome. So this idea of what or this, I'm, I'm calling it the Nero story. It's got a fancier title than that. Nero Redivivus theory. That, that thing, I don't, I'm not really fresh on my Latin. So, but this idea that Nero would be the one to come back, to, <coughs> to reincarnate, to come back to life. So I think John could be thinking about that in this writing. I think he's building a beautiful uh, comparison between evil trying to appear as good. And then he uses this phrase here, he says, where those who have not been written in the book of life. I think that's, I don't want to go there. I don't <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> for, the, for those of you who didn't hear Greg, he said from the foundation of the world, man, it, uh, that brings up a whole other host of questions and, and things to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on in, have a seat somewhere. Uh, we're in, sorry, did you look at our website? I'm sorry. I owe you an apology for that. We're in Revelation chapter uh, 17. Had someone do that last week? But we, COVID, we started something funky with our scheduling, but good to have you. Good to have you. We're in Revelation 17. We're at verse, um, we're kind of finishing up verse eight. Um, so we, we have this idea that it could be John focusing on Nero. We have this, this now, this phrase that those who have been written in the book of life, who have not, I'm sorry, who have not been written in the book of life. And I think that that's yet again a distinction between the people who are following God, the Christians, and those who are not. I think that's yet again this, this compare and contrast between the faithful and those who are not faithful. We come now to verse 9. I'm going to really kind of go verses 9 through 11. Um, John says, this calls for wisdom, the seven heads, and, and this angel begins to describe each of it gives meaning to each of these parts of the image. Um, so the seven heads, what do the seven heads represent? Seven hills. So the seven hills, where, where do we, where do we get that? Or what do we think that probably represents? Roman empire. Ancient Rome was called the place of seven hills. So probably yet again, building this idea of ancient Rome. Um, there is another idea uh, within the book of Revelation itself. John uses hills as a place of authority. Um, so this could be the seven mountains. And so if we're trying to take John's idea, it really could be more on the idea of authority. Where are the seven places? Of, are the, the seven places would be complete authority. Seven being the number of completeness. That idea of complete authority builds in the, the second interpretation of the heads. What was the second <coughs> interpretation of the heads? Kings. Seven kings. And he gives us a little bit of a detail here. He says that there are five kings who have fallen. One is now and one has yet not come. Oh, and by the way, there's an eighth king who is the beast itself. I'm going to go ahead and be honest. I tried to like match this up to Roman emperors and I struggled. No good way of doing it. I mean, symbolism may be there and you could understand that. Uh, 
but does it have to be limited to Rome? And that's where I think this is, this is, this is my interpretation on it. So I don't think John was necessarily trying to use seven Kings to point us directly to Rome as much as he's trying for us to say the way that nations rise and fall. And so I think that, yes, you, we do build Rome, the seven hills being Rome, but we have the seven, uh, seven being the number of completeness, the number of fullness, the number eight, uh, really hits an interesting point because eight can represent for Jesus, which then we have the beast who represents what? Well, the, the beast is an eighth king. Yet again, as I was saying earlier, trying to build this imagery or this comparison between good and evil. So the eighth beast being the antichrist would, would fit into this, perspective of I'm trying to show the world that I am really good. And the truth is, is where does the beast end up going to at the very end? He gets cast to the abyss. He's not good. And that's, that's the, the truth is, is the lamb is already good. So he's using tricks to feel or to make people believe that they're following the truth. He's a messianic pretender. And if you connect that with the description of Satan in one of the Corinthian letters, it's either 2 Corinthians 11, where it talks about even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. And then the guy in 2 Thessalonians sets himself up in the temple of God and proclaims himself to be God. Well, and then you, using our Roman history idea, who, who did the emperor think he was? Lord God. Who did he profess and, and have the entire empire to, con, to profess to him to be? It becomes very clear that Rome was the epitome found in Revelation. I don't want to jump too far ahead because I want us to make an application for us too. So Revelation, uh, we're now in verse 12. We're told that the 10 horns of the, the 10 kings, they were, um, who have not yet received power, the 10 horns being 10 other kings, you know, you could look at this as like provincial kings. Herod the Great was a king over a province. So we could look at this as 10 other kings. You could build this into the idea that maybe there's, more kings going on here, but the imagery is that all of the region is submitting its power back to whom? Back to Rome. All of this, all of these regions are submitting their power back to Rome. And it says here for one hour, just take a guess. What do you think the one hour represents? Short period of time. Short period of time. We've talked about the, uh, was it three? Was it three and a half years earlier in Revelation we were dealing with, and, and we said, you know, it's not a complete time; it's just going to be a time period. Well, one hour just represents a quick time period. Coming now to verse fourteen, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. Is anyone shocked that verse fourteen says that the Lamb will conquer? I'm going to take it. Billy, Miss Marie's, I saw Miss Bur Miss Marie, I saw your hand, but I know that you're just trying to adjust your phone. Um, she, she's back there shaking her phone. So evil will battle the lamb. The lamb wins. And he uses this, this title that because the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. What do you think about that? Why is that the victory chant? He is Lord of all lords. He is king of all kings. Who really has the power? Yeah. He is the ultimate king. He is the ultimate lord. So in this, and please understand, I, I'm not going to be little Satan to a puppet or to a... Um, powerless figment of the imagination. But 
who really has the power? So why do we fear? The lamb here is accompanied by those who are called um, or the chosen who are faithful to follow. And so as I see this, I see that, that there's this victory that we have the opportunity to be a part of if we follow the lamb and we follow him faithfully. Um, you could find other references where that idea is found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 12, verse 11, 13, verse 10, uh, and there's uh, and 19, verse 4. We have the opportunity to accompany the Lamb in this faithfully, as long as we follow faithfully. Verse 16 and 17, we'll get through rather quickly so that we don't run out of time. Um, the ten horns you saw, basically, as we come to an end here, um, notice what happens to the prostitute and the beast. Like, how, how did they end up really dying? One, we know that from the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, it's God's power. But what really ends up happening to them? The, the, the beast destroys the great prostitute. How come? I thought they were all friends together. Were they not friends? It's called greed. Greed. And, and even a false religion can get in the way of powerful government. You see, as I look at this, it, it, it's a civil war in a sense. You have what we have built as friends earlier in the book and, and throughout the chapter who have all of a sudden turned on one another. And the reason that happens is because wicked people will always turn on one another. Wickedness is self-destructive by, by its very nature. A godly life lends itself to godly living and lends itself to godly blessing, how come? Well, we could say that God is the one that gives the blessing, and that's very true. But a godly life lends godly blessing because it's in the way that God prescribed. The same being that an immoral or wicked life lends itself to immoral, wicked persecution. Why? Because it, it, the, the Beatitudes are not there. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that mourn for their sins. The fruits of the Spirit aren't there. The Beatitudes right. aren't there. The, the very qualities that allow for life to be good aren't there. And so in any system, church, government, um, culture, community, in any system, where goodness, where godly qualities are not found at the center, it will self-destruct. And that's what we see here. We see the beast turning on the prostitute because even in this moment, the greed that exists within them is the greed that turns them on to one another to total destruction. Uh, strips her naked. I think that's a, a idea of shame. <clears throat> Eats her flesh that shows that this is really some sort of a feast. Uh, and burns her with fire, uh, destruction. I've got three points that I would probably pull out of this text. Um, the first one being that although Babylon may appear to be winning, she is heading for destruction. At the opening of the chapter, we're introduced to Babylon and all the wealth and the, and the grandeur. We're going to see that more in chapter 18 and 19 as we kind of go through some of these, um, I'm going to call them songs, but as we as we go through some of these songs, we're going to see that wealth and grandeur that begins to diminish. Um, but going back to what Lovell said, the problem here is idolatry. Um, the adulteress, the prostitute, really is pulling out on her realm of idolatry. She promotes a sexual immorality, um, but she uses people and nations to indulge her passions for a luxurious life. She abuses and murders those who follow Christ. Those are her key sins. Which brings me to the question. <coughs> um, she rejects God in place of idolatry. For us today, how idolatrous can we be? Hmm. Or how idolatrous can we as a nation or as a people be? 
and I'll throw just two ideas out. You think of, of, of just even our sports, our entertainment industries. How idolatrous can we be? The second sin there that I, I said is it promotes a sexual immorality. Um, what sexual immorality do we see in our world today that may be even within our churches that is permissible? It uses, she uses people and nations to indulge her passion uh, and really for her own prosperity and for her own luxury. Does that describe the American way of life? This amassing of wealth for our own personal purpose. And she abused and murdered those who followed Christ. How do we talk about fellow believers? The second point. Oh, go ahead. The second point, while wicked powers are quick to form, they often um, self-destruct. I think it's easy for us to look at our world, particularly those of us who have been who've lived in the West and the United States for most of our life. Those of us who probably hold a Christian worldview to say that when God leaves the center of every decision, it lends itself to destruction. And my final point would be that Jesus wins the war, and we can participate in that victory by following him faithfully. We choose not to follow. We choose to not win the war, at least on his side. Comments or questions? I know Greg's got a question because I just heard so, but... <laughs> Uh, I think I'm, I'm thinking in the next chapter because there's a comparison between the uh, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb and great supper of God. Oh, yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. We'll save that for next week. Yeah. <laughs> I think there might be a message for us in that uh, being cautious not to be. Um, deceived by money, sex, and power, and all the things that flash, you know, that uh, the world bows to. Mike, I think that's a wonderful point. The things that our world bows to, do we bow to? Thank you, Mike. How close, how close can we get sometimes? without actually bowing. That plays into us sometimes. I heard a story once, and it's, it's a fake story. It's one of those preacher stories, but it's, um, you got a bus driver who's got a whole bunch of kids and he's asked, how close could you get to the edge of the cliff without falling? And the first bus driver says, well, I could probably get five feet. The next, next bus driver says, I could probably get a foot. And the third bus driver says, I got a left bus load of kids, why would I even try? I think sometimes we try to take the first two approaches instead of the the latter. You know, the beast is a great deceiver. We deceive ourselves long enough that we don't know. We don't know right or wrong. Yeah. We don't know whether we're deceived or not. Yeah. So he's got us. Yeah. Yeah. And what's in Chris's thought there, you read that revelation, uh, not revelation, but that Thessalonian passage were because they wouldn't follow the truth. God sent them a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. You know, that's, that's a scary <coughs> hot spot to be in. But Greg, don't worry. God would never do anything like that, would he? <laughs> mm. Laura, did you have a comment? I was just going to say, going back to what Mike said a couple weeks ago in class, it's the little things, little little oh. things that we do in our life that can add up to the one big one if we're not careful. 
thank y'all for joining. Thank y'all for joining online. Um, we will we'll leave this going for the ladies. And so feel free to go ahead and hang around if you're going to be hanging around for that part of the class. And uh, beyond that, we will see y'all Sunday, if not next Wednesday. Thank you very much.